Welcome. Uh, my name is Jay Grenier. I work at Image Metrics, and this is the first of many of our uh, free webinars. We're going to try to do them every week. We're going to sort of go through different topics. Uh, all of them are going to revolve around Faceware, which is our, our facial animation software. Uh, but they're going to rotate in, uh, in different sort of aspects around facial animation in general. Uh, we're going to do them on modeling, uh, or facial modeling, uh, facial rigging, uh, performance capture. Today's is going to be about animation itself. Uh, and then we'll even probably eventually get into, uh, you know, maybe some more technical ones, uh, writing skin shaders and, and uh, best practices for facial rendering and that sort of stuff. But today, again, it's uh, it's the first one. So it's going to, you guys are kind of uh, get to experience the, <laughs> as we learn how to use this, this uh, go to webinar and uh, we'll see how it goes. So feel free to ask questions in that question panel, and throughout the webinar, I think I can uh, I can unmute you guys if you actually want to get on the mic to ask questions. Otherwise, uh, I can just repeat your question to everybody. So the way we're gonna do this for today is for the first half hour or so, I'm going to give you guys a walkthrough of Faceware. Uh, I assume if you made it all the way to this webinar that you at least know what Faceware is, but uh, if you don't. Essentially, it's a it's a animation tool that plugs into Maya or Max that you can use to retarget the performance of an actor onto a character. Uh, now, it doesn't need to be a human character; it can be an animal, or it can be a uh, you know a, a table or something, anything with a face. Really, kind of the one of the nice things uh, that we've built Faceware to do is be agnostic to the type of rig or the type of character that you're using it with. So you could take a, a video of yourself, you know, whether it be high quality HD footage or just something you've, you know, filmed on maybe an iPhone or something like that, and you can retarget that onto any character. So I'm going to go ahead and, and show you guys how to do that. Uh, and after we do the demo, we're going to get more into some more specifics about facial animation in general, and uh, we're going to go through some tricks that we've sort of learned over the years uh, to help you guys make better facial. Uh, now this is, you know, we've been doing facial animation for, Im Image Metrics has for about six years now. Uh, the, the tool, Faceware, has been, the, the technology behind it has been in development for almost a decade, but we've been a production house for about six years, so we've got quite a bit of experience with facial animation. Now the stuff that we're going to show you might not apply to exactly what you're doing, but, you know, I tried to Really, uh, you know, I wrote down everything I want to go over, and I tried to only include stuff that's really going to be helpful to everyone. Whether or not you end up using Faceware, this, you know, these tips should be useful to you in whatever type of facial animation you're doing. So when we get to that point, I'm actually going to bring in one of my colleagues. Her name is Sarah LaPena, and she's an animation lead here at Image Metrics. She's been here for about four years, so she's going to offer uh, offer you guys some tips as well. So. Uh, after that, you guys will have a chance for uh, questions and answers, if we didn't get to them already. And that should take us through an hour pretty quick. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pull up Maya and show you guys how to use Faceware. If at any point my audio cuts out or anything weird happens, go ahead and uh, let me know in the questions panel. Just because um, since you guys aren't talking, I'm just going to assume that you can hear everything I'm saying. So right now I've got Maya up. Uh, now I know we have a lot of Max users uh, as well as Softimage too, uh, but uh, today's demo is going to be in Maya. Now the the workflow for using Faceware is completely identical uh, in any of the major packages. It's the way you actually pull up the plugin and, and open it is slightly different uh, between Maya and Max, but the the workflow as far as using the software itself is is exactly the same. So if you are using Max at home or, or at work, wherever, uh, everything I do today you can apply to Max as well. So don't worry if you're a Max user. I prefer Maya, so I'm going to do that, do uh, everything in Maya today. So I've got Maya open. Now this is a rig that we're working on uh, at Image Metrics. Uh, it's actually, I've met a few of you guys and you probably noticed that it's me, which is kind of weird that <laughs> they wanted me to be able to do demos with a rig of myself which is kind of kind of freaky but uh, it's you know it's interesting to, to say the least 
But, uh, you know, it's a work in progress right now. We haven't quite finished it yet. But um, I thought it was for, further enough, far enough along that we could uh, do the demo with it today. Now, this is an all-joint rig. Uh, there's about, I think it's about 4,500 polygons, something like that. And, uh, you know, it's decent quality. It, it hits some, some decent shapes, so we'll go with it. Uh, and we've also got a video that I'm going to animate that is something we recorded uh, with, with one of the guys. This is actually Chris Jones. He's our capture supervisor, our, our uh, performance capture supervisor. And it's just a video of him sort of saying a bunch of stuff. Now, I'm going to guess that you guys cannot hear that audio, but can somebody confirm if you could hear it or not? No. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, and the video is choppy because of the uh, the playback rate for GoToWebinar. So, uh, after this is over, I'll put these uh, I'll put these files online so you can actually see a little better, you know, what we were actually working with. Because we're kind of at the mercy of our internet connections using this tool, so it doesn't always play back too well. Okay, so back to this. Uh, now, right now, I'm not doing anything with Faceor. This is just normal Maya. Uh, it's just a regular rig and regular Maya. Uh, to open up Faceor, you come up here to the top, and you've got your menu, and then you've just got Image Metrics Faceor. Easy enough. And this is the tool. Uh, it's a very simple interface. You've got two major sections. You've got what we call pose groups, and then you've got your poses. Now, I'll go into more detail on what that stuff is in a second. So to get started, what we're going to do is we're going to open up Performance. So to do that, I'm going to come up to Performance and to Open. Now I've got three files that it's going to ask me for. The first file is what we call a Performance file. Uh, this is an extension called an IMPD. And this is a file that contains the analyzed data on this video here. Now when uh, sort of the way the general workflow with using Faceware works is that you would capture a video and you'd end up with uh, something like this, your MOV or whatever it may be, and you would submit it to Image Metrics and we run it through uh, our process that we call, uh, you know, just a, a facial analysis. And what that process outputs is this file called an IMPD. And it's sort of uh, an encrypted file that contains all the the, the raw information about the, the analysis, uh, as well as you know what the frame rate is and how long the shot is and, and things like that. Uh, for more information on that, check out the uh, the Image Metrics website or the forums. But I don't want to go into too detail too much detail now because it takes too long. So uh, the second file is the the character file. Now what this file is is an XML that contains data about our character rig, and it shows Faceware how to use it. You can use Faceware with any rig. Uh, but you do need to create this XML file the very first time, which only takes about five minutes, and I'm going to show you that uh, towards the end. The next is the shared pose database, which I'm going to leave blank for now. The other thing is uh, on these options, I do want to import video and audio because this is the first time I'm starting this one. You've also got options for set playback range and set frame rate. Just some handy little things that will speed us up a little bit. So what's happened here is we've got three pose groups now, brows, eyes, and mouth. And in here, it's actually imported a plane for us. Now, all this actually is is a, uh, a polygon plane with a texture map to it. And it's purely for my reference. Faceware doesn't need it at all. It's just uh, something I can use in the scene to sort of help me animate a little easier so that I can see the face right up close. I don't have to worry about alt tabbing to you know my different my, my video or anything like that. So I like to just position it on the left side and kind of make it about the same size as the, uh, as the rig you're using. But it's completely up to you where you put it. And again, you don't need this. You can actually, you could delete it if you wanted to. Uh, the other thing it's done is import the wave file at the bottom here, which you won't be able to hear it, but uh, it is in there. And again, purely for reference. Faceware doesn't require having that, but it will help you quite a bit. So. Now, in the pose group section right here, these three groups that have been created are the brows, the eyes, and the mouth. Now, when you use Faceware, 
pretty much the only thing that's difficult to sort of uh, wrap your head around in the beginning is that you have to learn how to break the face up into these three major groups. Now the eyes are sort of a almost like a superhero mask kind of around the area of the eyes that include the eye direction and the movement of the eyelids. The brows are everything above the eyes, so that would be the movement of the eyebrows, of course. Uh, and then we have this controller that kind of moves the forehead a little bit, and anything on the upper end of the face, any controls you may have up there would be controlled by the brows. And the mouth is everything below the eyes, so that includes the, uh, the mouth, of course, the movement of the jaw, the upper cheeks, the ears, essentially everything below the eyes. So that can be a little tricky to, to sort of wrap your head around in the beginning just because uh, most animators are used to treating the face as a whole and posing it all together. And you'll see as we use it why we're required to do that. And I promise you that it does, you know, it seems very awkward at first, but it gets pretty easy and it actually starts to make a lot of sense once you, uh, once you get into the workflow. So right now, uh, I started this shot right before we got going because I wanted to have a few poses in here. Now, essentially, this is what we call a, a pose-based workflow. And that means that the job of the animator is to set key poses on the rig on certain points of the video. So you can see that when you first start, you're going to look like this, and you're going to have no poses set, and it's going to be your job to go in there and add some. Uh, here, I've already added a few, so you can kind of see uh, what we've got here. Now, I did open up a new scene, though, so I'm just going to revert back to my poses. There we go. It's had to catch up. So if I click on these poses here, now what I've got is, I'm going to go ahead and fix them as we go. We've got certain poses that are going to define key points in the video that are going to enable us to retarget the entire performance. So by using only eight poses on the eyes, I'm going to be able to retarget uh, 340 frames of animation. So I'm just going to go ahead and start. Now, as I said, it's this is kind of where the animator comes in and will pose these frames. So let's see. What you're going to do is you're going to match the eye position as well as the, or sorry, the eye direction as well as the eyelid movement. So things like this, you're going to kind of match how much the, the lids are open and where the eyes are moving. Now what you probably noticed is that the the head of my character is stationary, but the head of the actor is moving all over the place. So what's, what happens is, if you don't have a rough passive animation on the head, it's a little difficult in the beginning to sort of visualize where the eyes should actually be, because the head's in a different spot. So what I have to do is sort of imagine that his head is in this position, and try to pose the eyes the way that they would be uh, you know, if the head were tilted that same direction, which is a little tricky, but uh, it's not, not too bad. So moving on here. Now when I'm done updating, or when I'm done with a pose, I want to just hit the update button, which will save out my pose info for me. Here we'll just cruise through them to make sure they're looking good. Now this one, uh, eyes are open about maybe a little more than his neutral spot, and uh, kind of looking straight, a little to the left maybe. So you can see that I've sort of matched the eyelids to, to do that. Now, what I'm using here is the, sort of for reference here, you can look at how much of the white of the eyes you can see. And you can notice that the bottom eyelid is just about at the bottom of, of the, uh, the colored area of his eye here. So same on this side. So when I'm using my character, I can sometimes use that in the same way. Now, for some reason, uh, the, the, the colored portions of my eyes here are way bigger than they are in real life. I don't have giant eyes like that. Uh, and they're bigger than Chris's are as well. So I'm actually going to take these down a little bit because it's not going to serve as good reference if they're different sizes. So that's just a little trick you can kind of keep in mind as you're going. So because your goal here is to match the position of the eyes, you know, relative to, to these two assets. You're sort of defining a relationship between this guy's eyes and this guy's eyes. Because it's not always a one-to-one. -one. In fact, it usually never is. So, you know, you're taking the, the performance of one actor here 
and putting it onto a completely different character. So how you define that relationship here is completely up to you. But generally speaking, you want to try to get it pretty close because it'll give you a, and that's sort of why you're doing that. So you can get the, transfer this performance over here sort of the same way. So I'll update that one. Let's check this one out. This is sort of a squint here. Yeah, that's pretty close. And there's a little bit of asymmetry. This guy's kind of got his this, this screen right eyes a little bit more open than, than this one. He's also got a pretty heavy fold in his eyelid. Now, I know on my rig I don't have that. I just have a regular eyelid. So I can't really count this as what I see. I have to imagine that that's not there and the eyelid's sort of coming all the way across. So when I pose it, keep that in mind, and something like this. So I'm, again, on this section here for the eyes, I'm posing out the direction of the eyelids, or sorry, the direction of the eyes and the rotation of the eyelids. One thing I'm not doing for this particular demo is I'm not doing the sideways rotation of the eyes. I do have that ability on this rig, but I'm trying to sort of simplify this in the because we don't have a lot of time. So just sort of purely open and close rotation right now. And always update when you're done with the pose just so it saves. Next one here, uh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Now the blink, this is just a uh, a blink pose, simple enough. Now we've got a half blink. So you'll notice that he's, you know, if he didn't have any eyelashes, which my character doesn't, you want to try to match the position there uh, where these two uh, where these two lids are. Now he's kind of looking down, so that means that. He's probably not, I bet his eyelids aren't coming up all that much. They're probably, in fact, going down a little. So it's just little things like that you want to try to look look for. So that when you're, when you're sort of defining this pose here, you're really figuring out what the actor is actually doing with his eyes and, uh, and not just visually posing it. Because your interpretation of what he's doing with his eyes here will directly affect your animation results. Uh, if that's a good interpretation, if you've really sort of analyzed it properly and you can see exactly what's going on with the eyes, then you're going to get better results. Uh, if you think he's doing something with his eyes, but you're, you're completely wrong and he's doing something totally different, then you're going to get a kind of poor result. So it's important that that's why I'm spending so much time really looking at his eyes and figuring out what's going on there to, uh, to get this pose correct. So this one, he's sort of looking to the left. That one looks okay. And then looking to the right. Okay, so we've got these eight poses here. Now I did cheat a little bit and make them before we started. Otherwise, we wouldn't have enough time to get through them. But uh, I would say to make these poses probably took me about 20 minutes. Now using those, I can just come down here to the bottom. And there's a big button that says retarget. And by hitting that, it's going to essentially animate the entire shot based on those eight poses that I've just set. Now I know that you're going to have poor playback, so instead of trying to play it for you, I'm just going to click through some of these frames and show you how close it got. And again, there's no head movement, which is tough, but we'll see. I wish I could play it for you guys, but I know that it won't even, uh, you won't barely see it. So, <laughs> But um, it's, gotten, uh, it's gotten pretty close, it seems. If I just scrub a little bit, you can kind of watch the eyes move. So essentially what it's doing is there's, the, the video has been analyzed by, uh, by the back end sort of part of face wear. And it has data on this face and it knows we've tracked where the eyeballs go and we've tracked where the, the lids go. So by using that data and combining it with these poses that we've just made, face wear can apply that information to the rest of the face. Uh, it's sort of intelligently animating it really uh, is, is a way to think about it. So that's basically what, that's sort of the second half of the workflow. Now what I do want to show you is how did I know where to put these frames? You know, I, I've not 
you know, I just sort of opened the shot and I already had these here for you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to go to the browse, which doesn't have any poses yet. And I want to show you the workflow from the beginning. So from here, the first thing you're going to want to do is we have to set some poses, just like we did for the eyes. But you have to ask yourself, okay, well, where do those poses go? Uh, if I just put them in any random place, am I going to get good results? Am I going to get the same sort of thing that happened with the eyes? And the answer to that is no. Uh, where you put your poses are extremely important and will directly affect the quality of your results. Now, thankfully, we've made it really easy for you, and we've got this feature down on the bottom called Auto Pose. And what Auto Pose will do is actually take all the work out of it for you and tell you exactly where to put those poses. So you can start with a low number, you can start with a high number. Uh, for now, I'm going to start with two, just to keep it simple. So if I start with two, it's created these two frames and it's telling me 43 and 192. Now what you'll notice right away about 192 is that he's lifted his brows way up. So we can assume that this is the highest his brows go in the whole shot. Uh, now the other one is sort of a more neutral. So the way this works mathematically, if you're curious, is the first thing it does is it finds the most average frame. Uh, in the context of this one video, Mathematically speaking, this, the position of his eyebrows in this frame right here are the most average throughout the whole video. Now the second one is the furthest away from that average. So it's basically saying this is the furthest away from that average pose. So if I were to get one more from here, now it's going to say where's the furthest away from this up pose? And that's going to be here, which doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be down. It just means that it's going to be different. And that's what FaceWare is looking for. It's, it's looking for unique sort of different uh, poses on the brows for, because we're on the brows group right now. And now it's going to ask me to pose these out. So if I were to go ahead and do this, I'm going to start with the, let's call this his, this, since this is his most average, let's try to replicate this here. I'm going to go ahead and, let's see, it looks like he's got, Again, uh, his head is tilted, so I'm kind of having to make a decision here on what his brows are actually doing, because I can't see it straight on. And uh, you know what, just as sort of an experiment, I'm not going to touch him at all. I'm going to leave him neutral right now. Uh, let's go ahead right to the larger one. And let's pull his brows up for this. Now one way you can sort of judge uh, how how high to put the brows. I mean, on one hand, this is your call uh, artistically as an animator. You know, you're going to have to make these decisions. You know, how, when, when this guy puts his brows all the way up, you know, how far up does my character go? And that's sort of the decision that you get to make. But one thing that can help you is if you look at the distance between the top eyelid and where his brows are and how much space there is sort of right here, you can sometimes use that for reference. Now I have a <laughs> I have a much larger forehead than than Chris does here. So for me, you know, his his are probably only up about that far and he's getting quite a wrinkle in his forehead, but for me that wouldn't really I wouldn't do much. So I'm going to actually go quite a bit further than he did. Probably something like right there. And there's not much asymmetry going on in there. I think on a minuscule level there probably is, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just keep it the way it is for now. Go ahead and update that. Now I'll go to this one. So let's see. If we toggle between these two poses here, sort of the neutral one, and then this is sort of like a, almost like a worried inner brow up pose here. What I'm looking for now is I want to, I'm trying to see how much they actually move between these two poses. I don't, because his head's moving, it's, uh, it's not as easy as just, you know, looking at the pixel information. I kind of have to analyze to myself how much they're moving based on how much eyes I can see and, and the position here. So if this is my neutral, I'm going to say that the outer brows don't move all that much, but the inner is just going to going to come up. So I'm going to grab this. I actually have an attribute over here. It will do that for me. And again, I'm just kind of doing this fast so you guys can see. And I'm going to I'll pull the middle down a little bit. We'll see what happens there.
Okay, we'll see what that gets us. Nice and simple. So now we've got three poses. We've got neutral. Now let me hide the interface. We've got neutral. We've got worried. And we've got up. So we're going to need more than that, but for just because I want to show you, we've got these three poses here. Actually, let's quickly give them a description. We've got worried and up. Now with only these three poses, I can hit my retarget button. And that fast, you'll notice that on the bottom, the timeline has now been filled with keyframes. I can actually click through again, and you'll notice that there's animation on the eyebrows. Now it's not going to be completely accurate because we've only given it a tiny bit of information and I didn't spend too long on those poses. But you'll notice that that quickly I'm getting facial animation on the character. Now if you're looking for you know film quality uh, superb animation here you're obviously going to want to spend quite a bit more time uh, on picking w which poses to do and, and how much time you spend on actually posing those. But in a lot of cases, uh, if you're just looking for some ambient animation on your character, you know, maybe he's in the background, uh, you know, just guys walking by in the street, th those sort of characters, uh, sometimes you can get away with doing really quick posing like this and just getting some ambient movement on there. And it actually looks pretty decent, you know, depending on how big. Again, I wouldn't recommend that for, for the main character of your game or anything, or, or your film or commercial, but uh, it's definitely that easy to get curves on your character. Now the initial output of that is going to be a curve on every frame. So if we put up the graph editor, so right now I've got two controllers selected here. You'll notice that the uh, the curves are extremely dense. They're going to be very tough to work with. Uh, I don't know if you guys have worked with mocap before, but something like facial mocap will, generally speaking, it's going to look uh, look a lot like this. It's very dense data. It's very high fidelity. I'm getting all these tiny little bumps and everything. But there's so many keyframes that it's going to be very tough to work with. So uh, because of the needs of our production team over the years, just having to clean up massive amounts of data really quickly, we've added in some, some pretty cool tools that I just want to really quickly show you before we move on to, uh, the, to the tool set. So the first one is pruning. Now what pruning does is it's sort of an intelligent key reduction. And what that means is, if I set this to something like 50%, actually, let's go even higher. Let's go 70, so you can really see it. Uh, that's a percentage value. So at 70, what it's going to do is it's going to resolve the animation. It's going to retarget it again, but with 70% less keyframes. So if I hit this button, and that's really how quick it is, you can see that the curve has changed massively here. But the important thing is these little peaks that were there before are still there. And uh, the cool thing about that is that it's intelligently reducing the keys on your curve. It's not just arbitrarily deleting you know, every other key or something like that or, or based on a value threshold. It's actually taking into consideration your poses as well as the analysis of the video and only removing keyframes where it's not going to screw up your animation, which is uh, very, very helpful. Now on the browse, you know, these little peaks and everything are nice but they're not going to be, you know, if that one keyframe was missing, it's not going to be the end of the world for, for your animation. But on something like the mouth, where let's say the, the rotation of the jaw, you know, that might mean the difference between a shape reading or not, that little keyframe that we just deleted. So that's a case where you, you really, you can't afford to lose this data because, like I said, it could, it could mean the difference between a good performance and something that barely reads. So the pruning is, is valuable in that sense because you can rely on it to, to not remove too much stuff that you're going to need. Now, if I set this to like 99%, you know, <laughs> it's going to resolve with nothing. So it's kind of, it's contextual to what you're doing. Generally for the browse, you know, 50%, 50, 60%, something like that's going to do you pretty good. Now, if you're working with animation layers, this might not be all that important to you because you can just work on another layer instead of having to worry about cleaning up this particular curve. But if you're not, then this is extremely helpful. Uh, the prune spacing is a tool that you can use to actually determine the gap in between keyframes. So if you want to work on twos, you can set it to one. Go ahead and retarget again. And now you're never going to have any keyframes more than one frame 
uh, apart, or excuse me, closer than one frame apart. So if you wanted to work on fours, set this to three. There you go. Now the fidelity of your animation is going to be reduced significantly if you bump this up too high, but uh, it is there for your use. Smoothing is slightly different. It's sort of uh, it's going to apply sort of a noise filter to your curves. Let's see. Let's look at the eye direction. Let's find a bumpy one. All right, so well, something like right here. It's not too bumpy, but if we go back to our eyes group now and we set the smoothing to something high, like 50%, just to show you what it's going to do. It's going to affect the curve uh, quite a bit, and it's going to sort of smooth it out for you. If you're ever getting jitter or anything like that, you can use that tool. Now, the last one, real quickly, is the master control, which is a really neat tool that we've added to allow you to line up all your keyframes on the same frames for every controller in that group. So for example, the eyes group here, if I set this to, uh, if I drop it down, it's going to show me every controller in the eye group. So let's say uh, left blink. We've got an attribute here called left blink. And I retarget that. What that's actually going to do is it's going to line up all the keyframes on the same frames here, nice and neatly for me, all based on the left blink. So that sort of sets that as a master, and then uh, from there it lines up all the other keys on those frames. But again, it does so in a way that's not really going to uh, change the fidelity of your animation too much, which is helpful. You can also set it to auto, which when you do that, you're not actually determining a master on your own, but you're enabling Faceware to look through all the controllers and determine its own master. So it will sort of still neatly line up all your keys, but on the controller that's going to do it in the best way, where you'll, where you'll get the highest fidelity. So I'd recommend always keeping this on at least auto. That's a feature we added in because a couple of uh, games we've worked on have had game engines that required all the keys to be lined up on the same. And when we got the game into the engine and saw our animation, it was completely different than what it looked like in Maya. So we were sort of doing some debugging and trying to figure it out. And we found out that the engine was actually compressing the curve and, and sliding all of our keyframes around. So we had to add this in to let the animators do it ahead of time so that uh, we could sort of shorten the gap from what it looked like in Maya to in-game engine. So that is the best half-hour faceware demo I think I could do. I mean, there's so much more to show you guys, but I do want to leave time for, for everything else. So what I'm going to do is uh, Sarah has joined me, but... We're trying to figure out how we're going to work out having two headsets right now. So go ahead and type in any questions that you may have so far, and just give me one minute to sort out this, uh, this new microphone. Okay, let's see. Sorry for the hold up, guys. Sort of working out the kinks on the uh, first one here. Can you still hear me? Go ahead and type in the questions if, uh, if yes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay, so before we go on, I just want to answer a couple questions that we got. The very first one was, uh, how much does the tool cost? Uh, the answer to that is the tool itself is completely free, and where the cost comes in is when we do the analysis on your video 
and send you an IMPD. And that's a per second cost. So say you had a 10 second video, you'd pay for 10 seconds of animation. And uh, as far as what the cost of that is, uh, I'm going to have to point you guys to, uh, to Peter Bush, who's our uh, technical account, um, or he's a technical producer really, and he's, he's the best guy to answer for questions uh, about sales. He's, uh, I'll give you his email address towards the end, as well as uh, point you guys where you can get some more information on pricing and that sort of stuff. Uh, next question. Let's see. Hi, the animation I need to accomplish has to involve very high detail on the movements of the tongue and the lips. Can you please elaborate on the capabilities for this, especially the tongue? Uh, okay, so for the lips and the mouth, it's the same exact workflow. It just takes a bit longer because the mouth is a little more complex, which is why I couldn't get too much for this particular demo. Uh, it does a very good job. Um, you know, it is based on your input as well, so it's not going to automatically do it for you. You still have to make those poses. So the skill you have in making those poses and making those interpretations will give you sort of, uh, you know, I guess a better way to say it is when you first start using it, the results you get are, are going to be based on, you know, your skill at using it. Uh, it's not hard to use. It's very easy to learn. But over time, you'll sort of learn how to make nicer poses and, and learn, the, uh, learn what it likes and what it doesn't like. And you'll end up with nicer uh, movements of the mouth and that sort of thing. Uh, but to, to answer your question, you know, you can... You can get very, very high detail on, on the, uh, the face and the mouth as well. Uh, that includes lots of subtle movement and lots of, uh, lots of little you know, twitches in the skin and that sort of thing. It picks those up very, very nicely. For the tongue, we don't actually retarget the tongue uh, simply because you can't see it most of the time. So you'll have to animate the tongue by hand. Uh, you could, or we have tried retargeting the tongue in the past. The tool does have the capability to, to do that, but it just we were never happy with the results, frankly. Uh, we, we preferred to do it by hand. So let's see. Uh, Danny says, uh, I saw you weren't messing around with the nose too much. Is it not important? Uh, it's not that it's not important. It's just that I don't really have time to do the whole mouth. It takes way longer to, to make mouth poses than it does for the eyes or brows, and uh, we don't have don't have enough time unfortunately but uh, there are some tutorial videos and videos um, of you know other other demos that uh, you can check out how we do it on the mount do you use proprietary software for tracking the videos uh, yes we do we have a tool that we use in-house that's based on the computer vision technology that our guys have uh, invented that we use to do the tracking and the analysis. And that's what outputs the IMPD file. Uh, the last question is, can you apply pruning, etc., to selected keys only? Uh, yes, I'm very glad you asked that because I totally forgot to show you. Uh, there are two ways you can do that. The first way is you have frame ranges here that you can break the shot down into frame ranges. So you can't you can't do it on selected keyframes, but you can actually break it down into certain sections to, uh, to allow you to only prune certain frame ranges. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can break it down into selected controls only. So for example, this one eye control right here, if for some reason I wanted to have 10% you know, uh, pruning on that, I can actually come down here on the bottom right and retarget selected objects or retarget selected attributes, which are what you have selected in the channel box. So uh, there, it's not based on your actual key selection, but it's based on these values here. Uh, some other reasons you might want to make new frame ranges are like if you have cuts in the video, maybe you, uh, maybe you have sort of a, a VO booth shot and you've got a guy that came back a week later and maybe he's got a beard the next time and you've got these two videos sort of cut together and he looks totally different. You might want to use different poses on one section from another. Or maybe you've got a really long shot and uh, maybe he's on camera for part of it but not on camera for another. You might want to apply a higher pruning value for the parts where he's off camera just because the programmers will love you because you'll have less data going into your game. Uh, that's just an example but you know there, there are lots of reasons you might want to break it up into different frame ranges. 
And all of these values here are based on this particular range. So I'm able to set unique values per frame range. The other thing I can do is turn my poses on and off so that I can use only certain poses on certain frame ranges, which is useful as well. If you've got a video where he's very happy in the beginning and then he gets very sad towards the end, you might want to turn off your happy poses for the sad section or vice versa, things like that. So there's lots of creative, uh, useful you know, things you can do with, with, uh, with that feature. So cool, thanks for the questions. Uh, we'll definitely have some more in a little while. Or more time for questions, I should say. So, okay, I want to go ahead and introduce Sarah. Say hi, Sarah. Hello. Uh, she is our animation lead. She's been with uh, Image Metrics for, what, about four years? Yeah, Something just like about that, right? four years. Uh, now, she, now, personally, I've been, I started as a facial animator here at IM, but I've been more on the technical side of things for the past two years or so. And I counted the other day, and I've done close to 100 minutes of facial animation. So since Sarah's been doing it the whole time, she's probably done, I don't know, do, you, do you have a rough estimate? I have no idea. I couldn't even guess. I mean, Red Dead was 400 minutes or yeah. something. So. Well, uh, suffice to say, she's an expert at facial animation, not just in using this tool and using Faceware, but because she's a because she's a senior, she's tasked with sort of training uh, new people on how to make nice mouth shapes and how to, uh, you know, how to make facial animation read and how to do really nice things with the face. And uh, the majority of the work we do is, is in video games, simply because there's a lot of volume there. But we, we definitely do commercials, and uh, we've done a few features over the years. So she also has a lot of experience with very, very high-end photo reel. Uh, facial animation. So again, like I said in the beginning, the things that we wanted to go over with you guys today sort of apply to everything. And uh, So what I'm going to do is I've got a list that I want to show you, uh, some tricks, and then I'm going to sort of have Sarah elaborate on each of these things, you know, uh, uh, both as they would apply to faceware and then as they would apply to, you know, just doing facial in general, whether you're doing it with reference or just hand keying it. Uh, so starting with the eyes and the brows again, the, the first thing that we wanted to go over was sort of analyzing brow movement in general and really trying to figure out what the brows are doing. Because if you are using video reference like this, your brows are in some cases going to be, it's going to be difficult to see what the brows are doing exactly. Like right here, it's a straight on shot and the brows are up. You can see the wrinkles in his forehead. It's, you know, it's simple enough. But if we find a spot where let's see, something like this, where his head is tilted down to the camera, here's a spot where you'll have to really figure out sort of what the brows are doing. Now, Sarah, when I first started animating this, auto pose gave me this pose as a start, and I was trying to figure out, you know, if there was asymmetry here going on in the brows. What would you, if you were just looking at this pose, getting ready to make a pose for it, what would you say about it? Um, I would say there is some asymmetry in this pose, definitely. Uh, this is where it gets a little tricky because you're dealing with a head rotation and this head rotation isn't even that bad compared to some of them that you'll see. And so face wear tends to pick the spots that uh, where the head is turned because it doesn't quite know what's changed about the face. And it, it just sees that the brows have moved in space. And so sometimes you'll get similar poses just because the head has moved. And so that's one spot where we would have to add in the pose. It may be very similar to something you've added previously, but you'll duplicate that pose because the head is turned. Cool. Yeah, and, and then, I, I mean, I know this is a super simple example, guys, and we'll move on right away, but it's just, you know, it, it's important to kind of note that your analysis of your video reference when you're doing facial is really important because... You know, if not, then what's the point of the reference? You know, it, it's not just, you're looking at a 2D representation of this guy's head right here. And sure, it's easy in this case to see that his brows are up because he's got wrinkles in his forehead. But how, just how far up are they? And is this one more up than the other? And, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it's really sort of the, um, I picked this one to start because it's really kind of a, a real basic way of showing you that, you know, looking at reference is more than just saying, oh, it's here, okay, move it here you have to really sort of figure out what's going on in order to get the best result. So 
Uh, next, we've got uh, for eye movement. Um, one trick that's that I actually learned this in school, and it's followed me all the way through through animating, is uh, when you do eye movement, you want to keep the your curves uh, linear. So if we go over here to our eye direction, and we look at the graph editor again. Now, if you think about the human eye, the human eye does not. Uh, oh, I smoothed this. Let's, uh, <laughs> set it back to normal. The human eye moves very, very quickly, almost so fast that, you know, unless a 30 frame per second camera is not going to pick up all the movement of the eye in some cases. So it's important that you keep that in your animation and that you set your eye curves to, to a fast sort of twitchy linear curve. Now, you're going to want to, you know, make if you are doing super high quality photo reel, you're going to spend more time and go in there and actually tweak all these curves. But uh, generally speaking, you're going to want to have that movement be nice and twitchy, which uh, linear curves will, will lend that to you quite easily. So that's one trick you can use. Now with the eyelids, it's not quite the same. You know, you're not going to want to use linear curves on the eyelids themselves, but on the on the rotation of the eyes. Uh, now for blinking, let's see, where was, where was our blink? There we go. So there's a few different poses when you're working with the face that you're going to want uh, to hold for a couple of frames. Uh, and a blink is a good example of that. Uh, Sarah, do you want to go, go into some detail why you would want to hold a blink? For yeah, generally blinks, um, when by the time we see them, uh, in the video, they may only last for a frame or may not completely close. And in order to get them to read, uh, it's very important to have them stay closed for about two frames if you can spare it. More if it's within a head turn. You really want to be able to sell that, that character is alive, and I think the eyes are the most important part of that. And uh, game engines also tend to drop frames sometimes, so if you're working on a game, it's good to have a two frame blink at least so that you can uh, you can read it once it's in the engine. Yeah, game engines have a way of really uh, <laughs> taking all your hard work and really screwing it up. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is a shame, you know. Well, engines are getting a lot better, that's for sure. But uh, they they can definitely do a number on your animation. So, it's uh, it's important to really sort of you know take uh, take take this sort of stuff and, and apply it, you know, to, to your work however, however you like. But, you know, this is stuff that we've just learned from experience from working with um, dozens of game, game engines. Uh, so let's see. Um, uh, th uh, half blinks, one thing we wanted to mention, is uh, that half blinks sort of, let's see, we had a half blink in here somewhere. 35, I marked it down. Now, half blinks are, from time to time, they're on purpose. Like, for right here, he's squinting. So that's not the best example of a half blink. But he kind of, you know, his eyes aren't closed all the way, but almost. So here, when you apply this, because you don't have, when you apply this to a, a, a game character, you don't, you're not going to have, most of the time, these heavy folds on the eyelids and these nice wrinkles. You're going to have to apply this sort of in a way you know, that makes sense to your character. And unfortunately, that almost never looks very good. <laughs> uh, unless you've got a super high quality cinematic uh, game character, you know, with tons of geometry in here and, you know, maybe some blend shapes or extra joints in the eyelids, it's very rare that you're going to find, you know, even on high quality rigs, something that can get that much volume in the eyelids. So if we look at these two poses here, you know, the, the expression that he's making on his face versus what the character's doing right now. You know, face wear aside, even if you were hand keying, that's going to be very difficult to get with, uh, with this character simply because of the limitations. So a lot of times it's not going to read like you want it to. So when you're doing that, that um, you know, that uh, half blink, you really want to make sure, kind of look it over and make sure it's reading the way you want it to. But if it's not, just turn it into a full blink, uh, because it's, in this case, he's actually squinting for a little while and watching, but if he just does this for like two or three frames, and your character does it, a lot of times it's not going to read like you want it to, it's just going to look all kind of weird, so it's in your best interest to actually make it just a full blink and then move on. So 
just another trick. We're running short on time, so I want to kind of speed ahead. Uh, for the mouth, we haven't talked much about the mouth yet, and there's some really cool things that uh, can help your mouth animation quite a bit. Now, one trick that I always like to point out to everybody, and this is big for face wear, and it's big for hand animation too, is that look at this pose that Chris is making right now. Uh, his mouth is closed, but if we go a couple frames back, you'll notice that his teeth are not together by the time his lips come together. Now, a big thing that we notice with a lot of junior animators working on the face, and people, uh, you know, not necessarily junior, but just people who maybe don't have as much facial experience, is that your first instinct is that say you say, oh, the mouth is closed, so I'll just close the jaw to get the lips together. But in fact, that's not at all what's happening. Um, so this is another example of when you really want to study your reference to figure out what the heck's going on with the mouth. And do I actually want to close the jaw, or is my jaw open but my lips coming together? So you'll notice that if I go a few frames closer, then his jaw actually does come up a little more. So on that first frame, though, when it touches, your lips are together, but the jaw's not. And you could really notice that by watching the chin, the actual bottom of the chin. You'll, it gives you a little bit of a better gauge as to exactly where the, if the teeth are closed or not without being able to see the teeth. Let's see. Uh, Stefan asks, is it possible to use blend shapes or morphs with face wear, or is it just for bone rigs? Uh, yes, you can use any type of rig you like. Uh, all face wear actually does on the technical side is set keyframes. So anything that can accept a keyframe can be keyed by face wear. So that means you can use full blend shape rigs, you can use uh, joint rigs or bone rigs, you can use hybrids, uh, you could even have it key a shader network if you wanted to, to turn on you know animated wrinkle maps and displacements and that sort of stuff. Uh, it can drive anything. Uh, we've yet to find a rig out there that it can't work with. So um, not to say there isn't one, maybe someday we will, but so far we've, uh, you know, because Image Metrics has had to work with such a variety of clients over the years, we've really had to design it from the ground up to be very open and work with, uh, with every type of rig. So let's see, next question from Tomas. Would applying facial markers on the actor help face wear's tracking using makeup or so? Uh, that's a question we get all the time. And the answer to that is actually no, because it's tracking. Uh, the, the tracking is based on not the markers, or, or sorry, not uh, because it's not based on markers on the face. It's actually built to shack, <laughs> to shack, to track, sorry, <laughs> the shapes of the, uh, of certain parts of the face. So for example, the tracking of the mouth, there would be, uh, you know, there, there's sort of an image mask that follows the outline and the inside, the inner line of the lips, and we would track that on every single frame. And what happens is, by knowing where those frames are, or where those points are on the mouth, uh, we can know where the rest of the face is. For example, uh, you know, we're going to know if your eyes are here and your mouth is here at this angle, uh, we can, you know, every human face is not the same, but they're sort of have the same structure, so the software is able to know, you know, where the nose would be. Ah, so he says, uh, I was thinking about the previous situation of closing the mouth but not closing the jaw yet. Now that's a spot where the tracking is going to know exactly what it's doing. But the problem is that the animator usually doesn't. So that, that was my point there, is that the tracking knows it, but if the animator goes in and poses it differently than what the tracking has, that's when it sort of gets confused and can give you uh, a not-so-desirable result. And I wish I had more time to go into that, but uh, you know, I want to want to get through. Yeah, okay, you understood, good. <laughs> uh, and again, we have, um, at the end, I'll show you where the, where the forums are, and you guys can email me anytime with more questions. But. Might have to do these longer. So uh, the next one is a, is an FV, or you know, like a like a f or a v. Uh, those are sort of in, in facial term uh, in facial animation circles. We consider those along the same lines because they're a very similar shape. But I've got one to show you right here. Now, face wear uh, in this case, this is a two dimensional track of this video. So even though in this particular shape you can see the shadow right here, 
and we know because we're animators that his bottom lip is slightly rolled out and it's pushing up against his upper teeth. But Facewear doesn't necessarily know that because it's two dimensional. So all it knows is that this is the shape of the lips and I can see a little bit of teeth. So when you pose this, you, you actually want to retarget it the way it looks and then kind of go in later and push it a little bit to, to make a stronger FB. And so let's see, for example, what frame is that? 48. So if I were going to pose this on my rig, I'm probably going to go ahead and open the jaw a little bit. And then I'm actually going to, even though I can barely see his upper teeth, just a, a facial animation trick in general is to show more of the upper teeth. In fact, if you know, you could be making an F or a V shape, but if you don't show the upper teeth at all, it's never going to read. And, uh, and your audience is never going to know, you know, unless it's uh, super clear to them. Uh, generally speaking, it, it's not going to read very well unless you're seeing that upper teeth. And that's to say, even if the actor's not showing upper teeth, you still want to show your upper teeth on those Fs, Bs, as well as the Rs. Any R shape, it's, uh, it's similar, except you're not going to be rolling out the lip. You so. just want to make sure that as you're posing for face wear, you make it look as much like the video as possible. And then as you go in to hand clean up, you can exaggerate the amount of teeth that are showing. So you, um, Jay's doing it very close to the video at this point. But as soon as he's finished retargeting and is going to start hand clean up, that may be a spot where he pushes how much upper teeth we're seeing so that it actually reads uh, in the game or whatever you're working on. Right. So, yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> but you explained it much better than I can. <laughs> I'm glad you're sitting. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm going to pose this, even though if I look at this from the side, that's not going to read as an F or a V very well when it's playing. However, it's better for me to pose this in facewear like this because it's more visual, and then go in there after and simply, you know, or do whatever I might want to do, like pull a pull the jaw back a little bit, or you know, maybe roll the uh, the upper lip, or lower lip, sorry, roll it in or or roll it out if it's an R, that sort of thing. Yeah, Chris is also um, rolling out his lower lip for an FB shape, and that's not usually something that you would think of if you're animating traditionally that you would do. So. Um, even with face wear, we would pose it like Chris, and then afterwards, if it wasn't reading, let's say when it was applied to the mo-capped body or in the game or in the film, we would adjust it to roll the lower lip in, um, just to make it clear uh, in a lip sync performance. Hmm. I think the, the the main point behind a lot of these are that even if you're animating with reference. You know, in this case where you've got face wear, where it's taking the performance of the actor directly and then putting it on your character, you know, or if you're just doing it by hand and, and filming with, or sorry, animating with your own reference, uh, you don't always want to copy exactly what the actor's doing. Um, because, again, this is not a one-to-one -one match between these two assets. It's not this actor, or sorry, this rig is not this person. So, and even if it was... You know, I have yet to see, I've worked with hundreds of facial rigs, and I have yet to see one that could hit every shape that a human being's face can actually hit. And I've, I've worked on some feature film rigs that have upwards of 500 blend shapes, and they still couldn't do it. I mean, it's just, the technology does not exist quite yet to hit, to hit every single possible shape that a human face can. They get very close, and some of them look amazing, but the fact is that you can't hit every shape perfectly. So there's always going to be a step where you need to make an interpretation, an artistic interpretation between these two characters. And to make facial animation read sometimes, you have to go beyond what your reference and your actor is doing and, and push these things further. I think that's also with all animation. I mean, you could say that about any animation. If you take even something that's mo-capped or or I take a video reference of a person walking across a room, and then I go in to animate that, and I 
rotoscope it, it's still not going to look right. And the face is really no different. You start off with a solid foundation with your retargeting pass, and then you push it to enhance the performance and to get what you need to get out of the performance to make it read in whatever you're doing, because ultimately, whatever reference you have goes away, and the audience has to buy that you that that's a, in a, a character that's alive. And for however long that character's on the screen for, it has to be believable. And so it's just pushing it a little bit beyond. And some of that can be done in facewear. You could, if it's there, you could push it a little bit, and you can take it a little bit further, and then the rest is to be done on your own through your knowledge of animation. So uh, we've got a few minutes left. Well, actually, we don't, but I'm just going to keep going because I want to talk more. But uh, if you guys have questions, go ahead and throw them up there now, and I'm going to. Um, I'm going to just show you a few more things and then answer some questions as we go. Uh, so the next thing is a ch or an S shape, as we've got here, uh, where his teeth are together. And you're seeing a lot of them. And it's sort of like a s sort of, sort of shape. I know you can't hear the audio. But uh, this is an S. And, uh, and one thing that uh, Sarah and I kind of talked ahead of time to, to go see what we're going to go over. And this is one thing she thought was important was... Um, was the S, and it, it's similar to the uh, to the blinks, where you want to make sure that you show the teeth for at least a couple of frames. Um, now we know that from animating that you need to touch the teeth to make a shape read, but in a lot of cases, you know the teeth are going to touch and then they're going to open up right again. Um, now that might be exactly what the actor's doing. But if you don't hold those teeth together for at least a couple of frames, you're going to have a tough time making that shape read. So that's another tip you can use. The, the same way that we use that we do that with the uh, with the blinks, you want to do it with the teeth. And that also goes for uh, an M shape or a B or a P. Any shape where the lips are actually touching together. We've got one here. You know, you want to hold that for at least couple of frames. So here you see that he's not quite touching there, touches it here, two, and then they're open again. So he's closing his mouth for two frames. Now in this case, it's quite close, closed, closed, and then it's uh, it's open. So that might read pretty well. I mean, it yeah. depends on your character. But in a lot of cases, you might go from here to like a super wide open mouth over one single frame. And humans do that all the time. And whether it's a matter of that the video didn't capture enough data, you know, it was too fast, or if he just talks extremely fast, that is not going to read on a character in most cases. It's going to be a giant pop. And, you know, you can't, <laughs> you can't go back to your audience later and say, well, that's what the actor did, so I made the character do it. It's, you know, like Sarah said, th your reference disappears, and all that's left is, is your animated character. So you have to, you're not going to have the chance to defend yourself and say why you did something. You just have to make it look good. In a lot of cases, that will mean changing a little bit what that guy's doing to, to remove a giant pop or something like that. This is a good example of also the covering the teeth before and after an M or a B to make the shape read more clearly. And that's another, if you go to the frame right before, you can see that you can't see teeth anymore. And this is a huge thing with new animators that I... I go over a lot is that if you kind of need to cushion into the closed and move out of it without uh, without seeing teeth and that M will read longer and let's say you have a character who's talking really really fast and you don't have time there's just not time for the extra frame for your M you can sometimes get away with it if you don't see the teeth for three frames and you make you know the frame before the closed and the frame after having no teeth. And this is a big thing that I see even in a lot of the games that I watch uh, or play. I see a lot of teethiness in the animation. And hiding the teeth is one of the things that really brings a character to life. So it's an important thing to learn the relationships, like you talked about earlier with the jaw, and where it actually is in relationship to the lips. Yeah, and, and the, the pose that I'm on right here, if this were a game character and I made, or sorry, any character, it doesn't need to be games, if this were a character in Maya or Max and and I made this pose, you would be able to see the teeth. Now, 
there's, uh, you know, his mouth, in, the inside of his mouth is occluded right now, so you can't actually see his teeth, but that doesn't happen in Maya. You know, as soon as I open his mouth, it's, it's bright white, like he's got a light bulb inside his mouth. And, uh, you know, in some cases you can put like a negative light or, or make your texture darker or something to sort of fix that. But, you know, in most cases, this is uh, generally what you're going to be working with. So when you're at this point making this pose, even though right now I can't see his teeth, if I were to make this pose on the character, you probably would see his teeth. So that's like things like that that can really screw you up when you're when you're working because you say, okay, no teeth, I better hide the teeth, but then you can't because you see them. So what do you do? And you know, the answer is to just sort of, uh, to the best of your ability, make that call about where his teeth actually are right now because you can't see them, so you don't really know. I mean, maybe they're up here, or maybe they actually, maybe they actually are right there. It's it's occluded, so you don't know. Um, and that comes up quite a bit when you're animating facial with, with references. Where the heck are the teeth? And uh, Sarah made a comment earlier about where the chin was. You know, sometimes you can use that to sort of judge how far up the, the jaw has come. Um, also, when you're posing in facewear, don't just click on the pose that's the auto pose and pose it how you think it looks. Um, Go a couple frames before and a couple frames after so you can see what the movement is in and out of that, and sometimes that will give you a clue. Because you might be able to tell by going, this may not be teeth, but because you start to see them there, right? So you may be able to tell, like, if you just got that pose, you might be like, oh, I don't know exactly where they are. But as soon as you look a couple frames before, a couple frames after, you might be able to figure it out a little bit better because this video of Chris is very clear, but we get a lot of videos that aren't as clear and you're, you spend a lot of time guessing where stuff is at. So it's definitely useful to just watch the video a few times through, scrub through the frame range that is next to the pose that you're trying to make to get the best guess. David asks, uh, would a side view video be helpful and could it be processed to complement the job? Uh, that's another thing uh, that we have tried before. Uh, you know, one, one of the nice things about this process is this isn't new for us. We've been doing it for um, myself and Sarah almost four years, and, and the company has been developing it for six. And uh, we've tried a lot of stuff. And not to say that we're not going to keep trying new things, but, um, you know, I can answer that question confidently that the side view is great for reference, but it doesn't actually help the tracking all that much. Uh, it it is more data, and, and in most cases, more data is going to give you more information and thus more, you know, better results. But in this particular case, uh, it didn't help all that much because it, there's very few cases where the retargeter and facewear don't know what the mouth is doing. Uh, this is a case where you can't see the teeth, so the animator has to make a call, okay, well, where are the teeth? Uh, you know, if this were a side view, you're still not going to be able to see the teeth. So in that case, it's not going to going to help you all that much. Uh, in some cases, that you know, let's let's see what's a better example. Like something like the F V, which I think was here. Yeah. You know, if this were a side view, you would be able to clearly see the rolling of the lip, which is um, which can help you a lot for reference because you know exactly what's going on. But there's really only two or three types of mouth shapes where that's relevant. And, uh, and to have the side view and to do all the, the processing of that and to sort of introduce an entirely new aspect to the workflow, uh, the gains we got from it weren't really, didn't make sense to, to add it in as part of it. Uh, it, it just didn't, it didn't help as much as, as uh, we thought it would. I think the benefit of like having a side view for a video like this, and we have had side views for some projects that we've done in the past, and mainly to see the jaw forward and back, um, that's probably the biggest gain that we've ever gotten out of it. And um, that's something that you can build into your FV shapes within Facewear, and you can retarget them, and then every time he goes into an FV, he will move his jaw forward or back depending on the actor and you'll get that result. So it's it's not something that's unpredictable enough, I think, to warrant processing a side view. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, as she said, we have used it quite a bit for uh, for reference. I mean, if, if we have the capability to, to film another angle, you know, uh, if we're on set and haven't, you know, 
have it set up and that sort of thing. It certainly helps a lot. And, and if you have that capability, I would say do it uh, just so your animators have, have more reference. It will, it will help them. Uh, so the next shape I wanted to talk about, or just not, not so much a specific shape, but uh, just the, the movement of the mouth is the, the opening and closing of the jaw along with the widening and the narrowing of the mouth. Now these are the two things that are going to be the single biggest elements into making your lip sync read properly. The, the opening of the mouth and the widening and narrowing of it. Now if you, you could have the, the most amazingly accurate mouth shapes you know, the CG world has ever seen. It could be perfect volume in the lips and everything looks great and, and they're all occluded and your shader's perfect and everything. But if your jaw is not moving up and down properly and your teeth aren't touching or holding and they're not opening quickly enough, it's not going to read. Uh, it is so much more important than the accuracy or the fidelity of your lips shape than, than anything else. You, you have to have the jaw opening in time. Uh, you know, to match what your character is saying. And the reason for that is it's just the, you know, for whatever reason, visually, it's the single most important thing to, to allowing us to really interpret what somebody is saying. Uh, you know, for, for reading lips or for, uh, I know it's funny they call it reading lips, but you're, you're not just reading the lips, you're reading the mouth, you're reading the whole face. And, uh, you know, if you think of something like, uh, like Jim Henson's Muppets, you know, all they had was jaw. They just open the jaw and close the jaw. There are no lips. There's no tongue. There's nothing. But you know, you still sit there and watch that, and you, those are believable characters. It's not super high quality, of course, um, but you know, on the most basic level, that's the most important foundation to making your lips increase. Now, the second most important thing is the widening and narrowing of the mouth, and Sarah can take it. Yeah, um, I guess when I, as I review, I review lots of retargeting passes and. Um, the main thing I look for and what I feel is a success is that the jaw is opening and closing at the right times and it's getting wide and narrow. And the reason I say this is because you can take that and we have taken that and applied it to body animation or um, and if it's a background character as long as those things are working it reads. We, there's not a lot of guesswork to be done. You, you buy it. You buy the animation because you're not seeing it as up close as you're seeing this video. So those are the most important things that, and I think that's where uh, Facebook becomes really useful for us is that we can get a quick pass, open, close, wide, narrows, blinks, a simple brow pass, and we can see what it looks like before we spend too much time focusing on the exact um, exact shape of the lips. Now, an up close shot, very close to the camera, obviously I'm going to be more focused on the exact positioning, but I think that for the most part, the wide and narrows are what makes your lip sync read with your open and close. It doesn't, there's not too much more that you need beyond that to get a basic pass that's working. And, that, and, and again, we're talking about just making it read here. And, you know, of course, uh, the, you know, the subtle motions of the lips and the volume of the lips and the, and the nice, um, the nice articulate shapes that you make are, are the next step. But, you know, as the old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, don't waste your time on those shapes and that perfect, you know, movement of the lips if the timing of your jaw's off or if the widening and the narrowing of the mouth is not there because it's just not going to look good. Uh, and again, sometimes you need to go beyond the reference a little bit. You need to sort of push the wides and the narrows. Uh, in most cases, you don't need to push much of the, the jaw timing because you know, that's human and that's natural. Uh, but the widening and the narrowing, you know, sometimes, like if you think about a, an actor, like I was just watching a movie last night with Willem Dafoe, and that guy has the widest mouth I think I've ever seen in my life. And <laughs> the whole time he talks, if you watch his mouth, it's just always extremely wide. Like he's got this enormous mouth. And uh, he's a great actor, and, and you watch him, and, you know, it's just so interesting watching his mouth and watching him talk because he's got, you know, he, he's, it's just enormous. And if you tried to apply that to a, to a character, you know, that, didn't, that you didn't know to be, you know, a, a real person, the first thing someone's going to say is, that looks so weird. Why is his mouth so big? You know, and that's a good example of, like, why you can't, you can't always copy reference directly. 
because you know sometimes people look weird, but because they're real people, you don't notice. But as soon as it's on a character, all of a sudden you're 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 picking it apart. Yeah, I think the relationship of the wide to narrow too can be exaggerated within facer. If you really pay attention to the placement of the corners of the mouth, the very widest point. Let's say, uh, like you're saying, the guy has a very wide mouth, and so you have it completely wide at that point, and then later on he narrows it, but he only narrows it like maybe a quarter of the way, but it, you know in order to make animation read that it needs to be narrowed, you know, half the width of the mouth in order to get that ooh shape to read, for example. That would be something that you could put into face wear as long as you are consistent from shape to shape that you could exaggerate how much wide and narrow he has within his mouth. Because even though an actor may have a wide mouth, they still go narrow a little bit. And you can take those small movements and make them slightly bigger. And that's, you know, that's what you would do if you had somebody with a very wide mouth with not a lot happening. So last thing uh, I want to go over is the, uh, the tongue. Now, facewear doesn't give you tongue motion, as we talked about before, uh, simply because it can't see the tongue, so we can't really track it. Uh, but that being said, it's one of the most important things for reading lip sync. Um, when, you know, I keep saying everything's important, well, because it is, <laughs> but <laughs> it's less important than the, than the movement of the jaw and the wides and the narrows, but I'd say it's right up there in the top five important things, because you could, you could have a character that has perfect lip sync, perfect timing on the jaw, perfect wides and narrows. But if he's got, he or she has no tongue, uh, a lot of those shapes are just going to look very strange and not read properly. So we won't go into too, too much detail because it's simple enough. But the, the main point that I wanted to get across was don't underestimate the tongue animation and don't leave it out. Uh, we've worked on projects where the characters have no tongues. They said we didn't have the memory budget to add in a tongue for, for this character. And then, and then you know they get upset because the the animation doesn't read as well. And we said, you know, sorry, we, we told you without the tongue we could have the nicest facial rig ever, but with no tongue, it's like, it's, it, it, you know, visually it just looks strange. People are going to say, why doesn't that look right? And a lot of times you don't place it right away. But if there's no tongue inside the mouth flicking around and you know hitting your L's and your D's and that sort of stuff, it's going to really really affect the quality of the animation. So no, go ahead. Um, there's actually. Their entire films based off of the tongue being animated. Uh, Happy Feet, they use the tongue for to hit all of the shapes. Guardians of Gahul and the birds in um, Rango, all of them don't have flexible mouths because they have these hard beaks. And the one thing that's been, that's, I mean, really important is the tongue in those cases. So... Um, I would say that those are great examples of the tongue being vitally important to getting your lip sync to read. Cool. Yeah, well, uh, that about covers, I mean, everything we wanted to briefly go over. I, these things are tough because I could sit here and talk to you guys for, for four hours about all of our interesting experiences and that sort of stuff, but that kind of defeats the purpose of what we're doing. Uh, but I do want to point you guys to a few places where you can get more information, uh, not just about well, mostly about face work, because that's why we're here. But uh, about, you know, facial animation in general. Uh, the first one is um, our website. We, if you go to image-metrics.com, uh, we've got a full, uh, you know, full website that has all sorts of information and, and videos. You can also download a free trial of Facewear uh, to try it out. Now, if you go to the support tab on the top right, there's a, a link to what we call the performance library. And there's uh, a bunch of videos here that you can actually download and test out Facewear with. And um, you can sort of give it a try. This one is a video we filmed with our head cam, which is a head-mounted camera that sort of films uh, a straight-on view that we use in full performance capture. And this is more steady cam stuff. And but there's lots of performances that you can try out software with to you know give it a go on your own and, and see what you think. Well, we got a question here. Uh, yeah, Tomas says uh, the trial version of Facewear is basically the Maya plugin and some pre-processed performance data, right? 
uh, and yes, that's what it is. Uh, the plugin, again, is completely free. Uh, you can get the Maya or the Max plugin for free off the website, and you can use it for as many uh, performances as you like. Right now, there's there's six different performances on here that you can use to uh, to retarget with and to, and to practice, try it out. And if you are curious uh, about potentially using Faceware for one of your own projects, uh, we can talk about processing some video for you. You know, maybe something like up to 10, 15 seconds. Uh, you can contact um, Peter, who I'll point you guys all to after this video, and you can chat with him about that if you have a video performance in mind that you want to try animating, maybe from your own uh, game or project or whatever you're doing. Uh, but yes, the, the download of the trial itself is just going to be an installer that will contain the plugin. And if you click on this link, it will you'll just have to fill out a form that says, you know, who are you, your name and your phone number and your email address, and then you just tell us which program you use. It does list XSI and Motion Builder because we are in beta for those two programs right now. So if anyone uses, or it should say Softimaj actually. I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know why it says XSI. If you're using Softimaj or, or Mobu and you want to try it out, uh, we have a beta program going on right now, so please contact us. They're not fully released yet, but uh, we do have some working copies. Yeah, and then just click that and then it'll take you to a place where you can download. Uh, the other thing we have is a uh, full forums uh, that have all sorts of uh, help and support for for faceware as well as a section at the bottom for facial animation topics like uh, performance capture modeling rigging animating and rendering uh, we've just opened the forums up uh, about a, a week ago so there's not a whole lot going on yet but please stop by say hello there is what else was I going to show you oh right in the forums if you go to training there's a full, uh, forum for character rigs where we've actually got four completely free facial rigs for you to download. Uh, there's one for Max right now, which is a, a bone rig, uh, game quality, and we've got three Maya rigs up, uh, two of which are for games, and one of them is actually a film quality blend shape rig that you can play around with. Uh, the rigs are still property of Image Metrics, so you can't use them for you know your games or <laughs> anything like that. But uh, you know, use them for your you know to try out and. You know, if you don't have a decent facial rig to try facewear with, then, then definitely download these and check them out. They're uh, they're fun. Uh, there's also uh, the Twitter image metrics account, which is you know, it's a it's a Twitter account, <laughs> nothing too fancy. But we've got lots of info on facewear and what's going on with it, so. Follow us on Twitter if you're into that. I'm new to Twitter myself, so I'm kind of trying to get caught up to up to speed with how to use it and all that stuff. But definitely check us out on there. And uh, yeah, guys, thanks for coming. Uh, this is our our first one, uh, so it, it was cool to see you know who was interested and and, uh, and how it's going to go. We're going to do these every week. I think next week's going to be hosted by Gavin Lewis, and uh, it's going to be about facial modeling. So if you guys have modelers in house or you know who uh, want to get some info. Uh, we, we have a full facial rigging and modeling department here, so we've got a lot of uh, really smart guys that are going to uh, share some info, and then Gavin's going to be here as well leading that. So check it out next week. And a couple more questions. All right, so uh, the main thing was please provide technical sales contact information. Uh, now, Peter is actually in the audience right now. Peter's the man that you're going to want to talk to. And we have all your email addresses. So he's just going to send you guys out an email just to sort of follow up and say, hi, thanks for coming. You're awesome. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you can just reply to him to ask any uh, sales questions you may have. Um, so, again, thank you very much. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. This is new for us, so we're going to, you know, hopefully improve them as we go, but uh, definitely uh, toss me an email, uh, you know, if you have any questions or you want to try out Faceware, you have more specific stuff, and uh, thank you, Sarah, for coming, it was really great of her to, to she, she's pretty busy right now with, with projects we got going on, so it was sweet of her to, to come in and offer her expertise, because
She's better than me. <laughs> so that was cool, guys. And, and yeah, thanks. Uh, take it easy, everybody. Hope to see you next time. Check out the forums or Twitter for info on when the next one is.